Look, you let me go. You'll be the hero that saved Translucent. Season 1, Episode 2 of The Boys is titled Cherry, in reference to the song Cherry Bomb by The Runaways, which plays over the episode's ending after Huey has detonated the explosive device implanted in Translucent. But before we get to that explosive ending, let's take it back to the beginning. Cherry introduces a diverse set of arcs that are expanded and explored in greater depth throughout the rest of the season. There's Butcher's complicated relationship and history with the CIA, the Mallory files are dead and buried. You're the deputy director of CIA operations. Dig them up. No. There's Homelander's mommy complex. You're leaking. But the introduction that's most near and dear to my heart in all of this episode is Frenchie. After I watched the show for the first time, I had a very clear bias towards favoring Frenchie and Kimiko above the rest of the characters, and I lamented how they didn't get as much screen time and material as some of the higher build characters like Huey or Butcher. But in revisiting Frenchie's introduction, I can appreciate just how much care is given to the character. On his first run, he's immediately thrust into into the action of the predicament Butcher and Huey have gotten themselves into by fighting and kidnapping Translucent, who isn't actually dead like they originally thought when they stuffed him into the boot of Butcher's car. What is that? Frenchie is a brilliant mercenary with an extensive knowledge of matters related to that line of work, including ammunition, since we see him working to build a custom bullet designed specifically to pierce Translucent's more or less impenetrable skin. He is also a skilled liar, which is a useful talent when the boys are on missions. Holy shit. He's the Homelander. I am talking to the Homelander. Mm -hmm. Frenchie did not want to get pulled into Butcher's mess, but he really had no choice once he figured out who Butcher had brought along with him. That's translucent. Frenchie also has a proclivity for illicit substances, but despite all these different factors, that could make him seem like little more than a shifty sidekick providing a service to the more fleshed out members of the team, the show immediately gives him more depth and substance. If you're going to cast an actor as skilled as Tomer Capon, you might as well make good use of him. He gives one of the more memorable monologues of this episode, in which he talks to Huey about a beautiful woman he once saw, whom he remembers in great detail, only to reveal that this was the first person he ever killed. I carry them all with me. It's like scars in a way. This informs the audience in no uncertain terms that Frenchie is a character with nuance and dimensions. I almost forgot that he had this level of character depth revealed before he met Kimiko, but as it turns out, we were always intended to know that there was far more to Frenchie than just being a cunning mercenary. Speaking of hidden depths, let's talk about Homelander. Anthony Starr ended up being one of the most talked about performers of the series after the first season dropped, but if we stop to take our time with each episode and really process what makes each one unique, Cherry holds some very interesting previews of what Homelander's arc will be across the season. It felt like a lot of people were surprised by Anthony Starr Star's performance, but as someone who watched Banshee back in the day when it was airing, I was not surprised in the slightest. His material was pretty jaw-dropping, particularly on the airplane, but I never doubted his abilities to effectively play whatever he would be given across the show's run. Considering how much of his character origins are still a mystery at this point in the show, so much of what Antony has to do to build the mystery of his character is embedded into Homeland mannerisms. When he's staring at his portrait and Annie walks in to greet him, you can't help but wonder what he's thinking about. Is it something in regards to himself? His history? The mentions of him previously having a secret identity that he has now given up on? But then, once Annie walks off, you can see that he's actually using his superpowers to look through the portrait of himself to spy on Madeline on the other side of the wall. Not only are we continuing to build up this unsettling dynamic between Homelander and Madeline, we also get this long close-up on Homelander's face, and Anthony Starr is so intense with his performance and the little facial tics that you can't seem to look away from no matter how uncomfortable you feel. Your brand 
is hope. Baseball. America. Homelander gets clocked by Madeline for using his laser eyes to shoot down the mayor of Baltimore's plane at the end of the previous episode. Almost as if from two small, high-intensity beams, roughly the width of human eyes. This is a nice way of setting up the larger mystery of the show's first season surrounding what Compound V is, but it also facilitates a greater exploration of the inner team dynamics of the Seven. Since the Deep was the one to go down and look at the wreckage of the plane and inform Madeline of the scorch marks that precisely resemble Homelander's abilities, the stage is set for a confrontation between the two. And by confrontation, I mean that Homelander makes threats and the Deep cowers in fear. One flinch of his thumb and the Deep's trachea would be crushed like a bug. It's interesting to see more of Homelander's true nature start to emerge, from the nature of his relationships with different people at Thought, to his insistence on doing what he wants, even if it's the exact opposite of what the corporate figures want. As for the Deep, this conflict with Homelander is also important to contextualizing who he is. He's a small, pathetic excuse for a fish man who takes out his being made to feel small on others. It's so gratifying to have Annie also put him back in his place because he lied about the amount of power he has in the Seven in order to be able to exploit her, but as it turns out, he is nothing of the sort. See, I asked around, you're not number two around here. You're just the fish guy. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't, I didn't really see anything down there, as a matter of fact. Everyone thinks you're a joke. Annie is grappling with the aftermath of being assaulted, but what I really appreciate is that they don't over-dramatize this storyline to the point of turning her into a helpless victim. Her story fully respects the seriousness of the subject matter, but The Boys is able to subvert from the typical pitfalls of stories that involve a man assaulting a woman because of the fact that these people have superpowers. Annie is absolutely physically capable of destroying the Deep if she really wants to, and we now see how truly powerless he is in the hierarchy of this massive corporate entity. Annie will undoubtedly have her own emotional scars to deal with, but we no longer have to fear for her safety when it comes to this specific predator. You ever touch me again, I will burn your eyes out. Cherry pulls the curtain back on so much more of the dizzying amount of corporate infrastructure that is working to build up and maintain the status and profitability of Vought's biggest cash cows, the Seven. Whether it's A-Train visiting a child at a hospital that had originally wished to meet Translucent. Turn that off. How many times do I have to tell you that A-Train needs to be scripted? Right. When he does not have a script, this is what happens. I'm on it. I'm so sorry. Annie finding out that all the patrolling she's supposed to do is largely set up in advance and quickly captured on camera to boost their image. A crime itinerary? Yep. Where and when to find the bad guys. That's what my department does. We vet leads, crunch satellite data, comp stat. Go faster. You're amazing. That was so great. That was really what? good. Smile what the hell for the camera. Is this? Yeah, stand over him and say this is lit. It's a significantly less romantic view of what goes into being a superhero. When people usually watch stories about superheroes, the focus is usually on a more singular threat that the hero needs to defeat. But The Boys isn't your everyday superhero property. It's a critique and commentary of the whole superhero concept, and it's a television series with a larger ensemble of characters and multiple episodes to explore their stories. You have the time Time to explore the logistics of how different superheroes are able to fight crime in general, and more specifically, as a team. But we see at least a 23% uptick in social media mentions and hero hashtags when there's a team up. People love a team up. There's a lot to reflect on regarding the cynical view of how corporations manage superheroes in this show, and how that directly resembles the way corporations in the real world try to turn a profit from superhero stories. However, this isn't criticism just for the sake of it. It makes perfect sense based on the premise. When you think of other big team-up properties that are nowhere near as self-aware as the boys, what do they have in common? A really rich white guy to foot the bill. Tony Stark and Bruce Wayne can more or less get their hands on the property, 
weapons, and costumes they will need to fight crime. But in this story, there is no magical rich white guy to snap his fingers and fund the Seven, so it's only logical that a corporation would get involved. Annie's not big on corporate management though, so when she sees someone in danger, especially when that someone is a woman about to be assaulted by two men, of course she's going to step in. And I love this moment because it's a healing, cathartic moment for her. There is so much shame and self-blame that she's experiencing after being assaulted, but she's taking the steps to find her way back from it, and this is part of that journey. Admittedly, the corporate figures don't respond well when Annie is caught on camera, but her clash with the higher-ups has only just begun. But you have to cancel everything, okay? You're gonna have meetings with risk assessment, with crisis management, with legal. Finally, we circle back around to Huey and his continued descent into all of the conflict and danger that comes with joining the boys. Despite the fact that this episode is highly eventful and has a lot going on for multiple characters in this ensemble, there is still a significant amount of time given to Huey to flesh out how he's struggling to cope with the ethical conundrum of seeking revenge against a superhero, even though Huey at his core has always been a kind, well-meaning sort of person. It can't be easy to reconcile the person he's always been with these new, darker feelings coming in. Wasn't an accident. All right, all right, all right. my point is, you're a good boy. You're a sensitive boy. Come home. The recurring emphasis on this poster is a way of externally displaying what Huey is feeling internally. Just like Translucent monologuing about his ability to read people is ultimately a way for him to tell the audience what Huey is feeling and grappling with. I know some people don't like long monologues sharing too much information because they want the show don't tell rule to be adhered to in filmmaking, but this episode strikes a really good balance in informing the audience of Huey's inner conflict so that the tension is effectively built before he goes over the edge. <laughs> everyone, it's Lady Genevieve. Thank you so much for watching my video on season one, episode two of The Boys. If you are new here, I have linked a playlist of all my videos on The Boys in the pinned comment of this video, so feel free to browse through them. I have plenty of other videos on films and television series on my channel as well. I know I didn't get to every little plot point and detail in the story, there was that whole blackmailing setup involving the senator and the shapeshifter, but that particular storyline is more so part of a slow burn leading up to bigger revelations about Compound B that I would rather wait and talk about in later videos once more things are actually revealed about it. I will say though that making these videos is a really fun way of refreshing myself on the material before season 2 premieres, and also it's a way for me to really take my time with the material to notice more details than when you just binge through it. A lot of streaming platforms drop entire seasons of their shows in one go because with the rise of streaming platforms, there's also been a rise in binge watching series. But I'm glad that we are starting to see a shift away from that where more shows on these streaming platforms are starting to release their episodes gradually so the audience is able to take their time with the material. When you binge the entire first season of The Boys, there are very specific things that will stand out like Huey losing Robin to Asia train, Homelander on the plane, Butcher with the baby, the deep with the gills, yikes. But when you have to consume the show one piece at a time, there are so many more details that you get to appreciate. Apple TV Plus has been pretty consistent in using this model for their scripted fictional shows where three episodes will premiere first and then one new episode airs each week until the finale. I'm really glad that The Boys is going to be doing that as well for season two because we as the audience will be able to take our time with appreciating the escalating drama and shenanigans that I have no doubt are going to come. Subscribe to follow along as I will be doing videos on all of the remaining episodes of The Boys season one leading up to the season two premiere on September 4th. You can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.